From the California State Senate, this is Senate Spotlight. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this edition of Senate Spotlight, where we discuss legislative priorities and policy and other related issues with members of the California State Senate. From the state capitol here in Sacramento, I'm Brian Green, and proud to have back to the Senate Spotlight desk once again, uh, State Senator Mark Leno from San yes. Francisco, also chair of the uh, Senate Budget Committee. Welcome, that's glad right. to have you again. Brian, great to be back. Uh, here we are in the waning weeks, if that's the right phrase, of 2013 legislative session. Two to be exact. Two to be exact as yeah. we speak, and it's been a summer of uh, mass machinations and fascinations and uh, negotiations, and some of this actually kind of making history, at least the discussion and a lot of work to do in the next couple of weeks before session ends in September. And as budget chair, I know a lot of your past summers have been trying to put together a budget in tough, lean economic times and trying to save the state from going off the fiscal cliff, but there's still issues outside of the budget, particularly this year, that affect the budget that you and your colleagues are trying to resolve and reconcile. And as we speak, there's actually one matter that is on the table and is almost ready to reach crisis mode, you could say, at least by appearances. And that's the problem of prison overcrowding. Uh, the governor has been given a mandate by the federal court of the end of the year to reduce the state's prison population to, I think it was 137.5%, nearly 10,000 prisoners, is of, that right? That's 137.5% of capacity, which right. translates to reducing our inmate pop population by another 9,600 from where we are today. And keep in mind, we've already reduced it by over 40,000 as a result of the governor's realignment proposal, which just shifts lower level of offenders from serving their time in state prison to county authority, meaning either time in county jail or using other alternative sanctions, such as uh, GPS ankle bracelets mm -hmm. or getting people into drug and alcohol treatment programs or whatever else they might need. So it doesn't mean having to put everyone into county jail. Right, but it almost does sound like, from what I understand, that we're sort of running out of, lo of uh, nonviolent offenders, if you will, to, to relocate. And that's not being glib, but just the way somebody had described it. And that you and your Senate colleagues, led by the, uh, the pro tem, as uh, the governor pushes back and, and comes up with his own alternatives and suggestions of, uh, of uh, pr private prisons and farming out inmates to other states, you have, uh, and your colleagues have kind of declared the solution of capacity expansion a real non-solution and uh, are pushing for a, a lot of particular elements of this, including a, an extension of this deadline. And this really does kind of get complicated now and even sort of drives a wedge between the unity of uh, you and your Democratic colleagues and the governor. Let's talk a little bit about uh, what this particular plan is, what the debate is right now, and then we'll speak to some of the more systemic issues and the efforts you have made to try to get to the problem of the way we sentence people and incarcerate people here in California. So let's talk about some of the distinction. What's the governor asking for? Uh, what is the Senate Dems asking for? Again, the response is to the federal court right. that has ordered we must reduce our prison population by another 9,600. The governor has pushed back. Daryl Steinberg, as our leader of the Senate, has pushed back with the governor, telling the courts we've reduced our prison population by over 40,000. This 137.5% of capacity is an arbitrary number. We don't need to do any more. He has appealed. He has lost every appeal and the deadline's coming up December 31st. So the governor has framed the issue of having to make a decision of one of two choices, that his only choices are to release 96,000 criminals back to society or find some other place to put them. And he wants to contract with private prisons and prisons out of the state of California at a cost, as the governor has said himself, of billions and billions of dollars to do so. Senate Democrats have said, the frame is inaccurate. It is not the choice between release or further capacity. There are other ways to do this. And so I think President Pro Tem Steinberg is very accurate in saying, well, why don't we sit down with the plaintiffs in this case mm -hmm. and see if we can't reach a settlement so that we can get the federal court off of our backs? Because even if the governor were to get for this year $315 million and $400 million plus going forward each year, potentially forever, mm -hmm. for greater capacity, it doesn't get the court off of our back and they will be monitoring every day to see if we go over the cap. And in fact, even if the governor were to get his money and were to get his greater capacity and meet the cap by the end of December, and there's great doubt that it could even happen that quickly, but even if he could, because we have a 70% recidivism rate in the state of California, we'll bust that cap even with the greater capacity in a month or two or three, so it doesn't solve the problem, and there's still risk of 
criminals being released mm -hmm. under the governor's proposal, though he somewhat denies that. In any case, if we were to reach a settlement with the plaintiffs, we could take the hammer of the 31st of the end of this year out of the picture, give us more time to work with the plaintiffs, and use evidence-based results and programs that we know, in fact, can cut our recidivism rate in half, which is the core of the problem. And so greater capacity at huge expense mm -hmm. to everything that matters to Californians, including education, which everyone acknowledges is the best crime preventive tool known to humankind. Why would we throw, as the governor himself said in January, billions of dollars down the rat hole of the mm -hmm. prison system when we know that there are ways to keep people successful in their probation and in their parole so they don't commit another crime, which means safer communities for everybody, lowers our inmate population, and saves everyone a lot of money. That's the direction the Senate Democrats want to go. And I know that this is a team effort, but isn't the Senate plan modeled in a lot of ways after your own legislation from a couple of years ago, the SB 678? I was able to partner with a Republican colleague three years ago, it was in 2009, and we took one time $45 million federal stimulus money to invest in programs with the county probation departments in counties throughout the state of California in programs that we know can keep people successful in their probation. We're talking about remedial reading for vocational education, drug and alcohol treatment, mental health services, whatever that probationer or uh, parolee needs. And in the first two years, we kept 9,600 probationers successful in their probation, which by definition means they did not commit another crime. They did not come to the state prison system, so we kept 9,600 people out of our state si prison system. Mm -hmm. We saved over $500 million, which we then shared with counties to the degree that they kept people from coming into the state system to continue to invest in the programs that kept those probationers on the straight and narrow, not committing more crimes. It's worked. We want to expand that $45 million investment that returned 10 to 1 to $200 million. Imagine what we'll, we could do. The pushback from the speaker and the governor uh, in this last few days as this uh, plan was announced by the Senate Democrats was uh, you've, been, you've been criticized as kicking the can down the road and the speaker says what you and the Senate Democrats want is already included in their plan and they're somewhat frightened by the fact that you would want to negotiate with the plaintiffs for an extension and I understand the plaintiffs actually are supporting the Senate proposal. Let's take uh, what, it, what do you say to let's that? Let's take it point by point. Who's kicking the can down the road? Greater capacity does not deal with the problem. The problem is the can. They're kicking it down the road. We're taking it in hand and saying, let's deal with the problem. The problem being a 70% recidivism rate. That means someone coming out of our system within 18 months will again commit another crime. The national average is 35%. So we're spending now twice the amount of our general fund on the Department of Corrections, 10%. Just 10 years ago, it was 5% of our general fund on corrections. That means sucking money from all the other important programs in state government and getting the worst recidivism rate in the country. So we're not kicking the can down the road. Mm -hmm. We're dealing with the problem. And then with regard to, what are the other criticisms? Well, just that, that everything is that the Senate Dems are suggesting is already in the governor's not proposal. Not true at all. Okay. Not true at all. They want to spend as the governor said, billions and billions in the next couple of years for greater capacity. And the governor has suggested we'll then get to the reforms that we're talking about. But the fact is, if we're spending billions and billions, there will be no money left over for anything. And we will continue to rank 47th out of 50 in per pupil funding for kids in our K through 12 education system. We won't be able to restore the billion dollars we cut from UC and from CSU and from community colleges and from our court system and from our child care and CalWORKs programs. We cut a billion out of all of those. And if you throw it all at greater capacity for our prison system, there will be no money left for anything else. And that's what we're fighting to prevent. And there did seem to be some concern about sort of the awkwardness of the strange fellows, if you, if you will, of trying to negotiate with the plaintiffs like the Senate Dems want to do. What could be more reasonable than to sit down with those who have taken us to court to have a court decide that we have to release so many tens of thousands or do something with tens of thousands of inmates because it is cruel and unusual punishment 
which is a constitutional problem for the state. And that's why we have these two court cases and this requirement by the federal court that we must reduce our prison population one way or the other. The governor and the assembly Democrats want to go one way along with the Republicans. We want to go another way, which every editorial board to date has said makes sense. And, and polls, in fact, are saying this is what Californians we want. We have right? every polling. Californians get that we cannot incarcerate our way out of this problem. They want to spend less on corrections. They want to spend more on education, more on health care, more on social services. Well, this debate defaults back, if you will, to the larger discussion of prison sentencing, who we have behind bars, the lengths of sentences that those folks are given, and their pernicious effect sometimes of the uh, sentences on recidivism, recidivism rates and lives, as you've talked about. You, once again, are attempting this year to address the issue this session with your own legislation dealing with the sentencing reforms, yes. in this case, the reform of California's drug sentencing laws, sort of a systemic reform here. Tell us about AB, uh, SB 649, the Local Control Sentencing Act. We've all heard these stories about these harsh sentences for these relatively minor drug offenses, uh, incarceration instead of treatment. What do you want to do? So we want to follow the lead similarly to 13 other states that currently charge the crime of simple possession, and that's a particular crime, not with intent to sell or selling or manufacturing or distributing, just simple possession, which currently is a felony here in California. Though, uh, for some reason, some drugs, such as methamphetamine and hashish and LSD, is considered a wobbler, which means the district attorney has more authority, can charge it either as a felony or there may be circumstances that suggest it should be charged as a misdemeanor. Thirteen other states actually charge them strictly as misdemeanors, and what we've learned from these 13 other states is they have lower rates of drug use, higher rates of drug treatment participation, even lower rates of violent and property crime. So if our goal is safer communities, why wouldn't we do what these 13 other states do? There wasn't the political will last year to change it from felony to misdemeanor. So we've taken a middle ground and said, okay, district attorneys, we're not going to take anything from you. We're not going to take the felony option from you. We're going to give you more authority, more discretion. And that's what SB 649 is, very much aligned with what Eric Holder is talking about, our U.S. Attorney General, who is saying, let's get rid of these mandatory minimums for low-level drug crimes for simple possession and a strict felony for cocaine and heroin is a mandatory minimum. It doesn't allow a district attorney to do anything but. And mostly these felonies are falling on younger people mm -hmm. disproportionately from the African American and Latino communities. And of course a felony on a young record can be so destructive to their lives because the three things that keep someone successful in their recovery from drugs is access to housing, education, and employment. And with a felony on your record, you can't even live with your mother if she's getting assistance in her housing. You'll never get a Pell Grant or a Cal Grant. Your hopes of going to college out the window. And with a felony on your record, you will be lucky to get a minimum wage paying job for the rest of your life. So the public policy question is, who benefits from perpetuating a chronic underclass of citizens who can never get out of their situation. And, and, and so that's if, what we're doing And right so, in now. fact, this does make a difference in terms of access to jobs and housing to these people. To the degree that we can keep low-level offenders, non-violent, non-serious, simple possession drug offenders from having to go through life with a felony on their record, we are improving society. Now, of course, there's opposition. The DAs and the law enforcement, uh, a lot of them say that you're minimizing the consequences of this addictive and destructive behavior, that the current conviction status is actually an incentive for completing a lot of the treatment programs. And guess and what? This, uh, this we're not taking they, that they're referring to the felony charge, and we're not touching that. Possession of methamphetamine is currently a wobbler, meaning they have the option of a felony or a misdemeanor. In some counties, it's charged 100 percent of the time as a felony. We wouldn't change that for cocaine and for heroin if that's what they want to do. In some counties, 100% they're charged as misdemeanors. And in San Francisco, for example, it's 50-50. Mm -hmm. So let local district attorneys have more discretion, more authority. Isn't it curious that we want to give the district attorneys more authority and the California District Attorneys Association is opposing our giving them more authority? They don't want to use their own good judgment. It confounds me. The three strikes mania from a couple of decades ago with the heavy sentences for repeat offenders, particularly even the nonviolent felons, and we've heard the stories about the, the guy that was sentenced to 20 years in prison for stealing a piece of pizza or something like that. Are we seeing the, the scales sort of sway the other Very way now so. over I think, your I, I legislation think, being an example of that? I think 
polling shows, uh, specifically on this misdemeanor debate, and again, our bill is not a strict misdemeanor. It gives DAs an option, but 70% of Californians think that all simple possession drug cases should be charged as misdemeanors. Voters get this. There is no cross-tab of that poll that shows more than 50% want the felony, even among Republicans and older voters and Central Valley voters, over 50% believe misdemeanor is the way to go. Just as a final thought here, I want to focus on the effect that this does have on lives. And you called it yesterday, you mentioned it in a press conference, the generational loop. You mentioned going to this White House conference yes. on the effect of, uh, of uh, impact of children of incarcerated parents and seeing this. Talk about it a little bit and how that, that tangible or intangible effect it does have on families. To the degree that we take more and more parents out of their homes to be incarcerated and to have the the onus of a felony on their record, it impacts the next generation because when kids don't have their parents in their home, we know that their grades fall, we know that their graduation rates from high school fall, and a child without a high school diploma has a seven times greater likelihood of finding his or her way into our criminal justice system. And so it just repeats itself, and this is what I'm talking about when I use the term chronic underclass of citizens. It just perpetuates itself, and this is also a part of the greater disparity in income and wealth in this country when you have people who can't get anything more than a minimum wage job, who can't get a college education because they've been incarcerated, they've got a felony on their record. This has not worked for 30 years. We're talking about an overcrowded prison system because this is what we've been doing for 30 years. We have to do something different. Other states are doing it. Texas. New York are reducing their prison populations and reducing their crime rates simultaneously. It can be done because they're investing in things that keep people successful in their lives, such as education, and we're not doing it. Does this prison overcrowding issue sort of threaten the, uh, the uh, good vibe here for the end of session? It's been a pretty quiet, pleasant session, and I know it's not all about the group hug, but does this threaten to kind of derail uh, the comedy between the houses, between the leadership as you go along? I certainly want to remain hopeful and positive that calm minds can come together and to find a thoughtful solution, but we believe so strongly as Democrats in the state Senate that this is a really critical point in our public policy making and that we must stand our ground and we must make sure that something other than only capacity is the resolution to the court order. Likely there will be some compromise that will find some middle ground, but it cannot just be what the governor is proposing now. Not only can we not afford it, it would be failed public policy and we would pay the price for years to come. Right. There's so much I could talk to you about. I could do, yes. you, do an hour here with you, but we're out of time. Thank you for your uh, calm mind and your common solutions. It's always good to, you, to chat and spend time with you. So good thank to be you. With you. you bet. State Senator Mark Leno from San Francisco, the chair of the Senate Budget Committee, and that is it for this edition of Senate Spotlight. And we invite you to join us next time around as we discuss important legislative issues and policies with the newsmakers and newsbreakers of the California State Senate. From the State Capitol in Sacramento, I'm Brian Green. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching Senate Spotlight.